Hey everyone, welcome to the first whenever we feel like it of the fall semester, and the only whenever we feel like it. The readings are so good, we only need to have one per semester now. Um, and this is a new room for many of us. Many of us have been here before, but it's different. Um, we're gonna experience some amazing tech tonight because Bianca Stone is snowed in in Vermont. So she is gonna read to you via Google Hangouts. Um, you're gonna have to turn around towards the back to see that, but what is poetry if not an act of contortioning? Hey, Bianca. Um, so we'll have three readers tonight, Connie Yu, Bianca Stone, and Lainey Brown, in that order. Um, we have books for sale. See Shana in the back. Books are at cost. Really great deals on really great books. And we also have three broadsides, one from each poet. Probably go together like a triptych. I don't know what order. You'll have to decide. These are complimentary. They're beautiful. Made by the Robinson Press, which is an imprint of the Common Press, which is at Penn. You can get involved with the Common Press. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm Michelle Taransky. This is the, I think, the eighth year I've had the series here. This morning I woke up and thought it had been 10 years and went to do some archival work, and it had only been eight. But the first reader of the series in Philadelphia is actually here tonight, Natalie Lyelin. So uh, <laughs> comes full circle, and we'll be here for the 10-year anniversary party in two years. I, I hope you will, too. But without too much further chatter, um, I want to bring up Connie. Connie was a student in my writing seminar. They've worked at Writer's House with Jacket 2 and on lots of amazing projects. And they're probably annoyed that I keep emailing and saying excited, excited, excited. It's sort of just how I feel about hearing the work in this room. And I hope you guys feel the same way. So please welcome Connie Yu. Thank you, Michelle, for bringing me here. Um, thank you, Lainey, for being here. I'm so excited to be here and reading in the same room as you. I just moved the mic. Is that OK? OK, cool. Thank you, Zach, for doing tech. It's really exciting to be in this room. I feel like I've spent a lot of time here, but not quite in this fashion. Um, cool. I'm going to be reading from this essay that is about me looking for work and also working on myself. You know. So, cool. While moving slowly and then all at once through Hita Sterl's duty-free art, I had this feeling that she could be the machine that identified all the buildings in a nine-panel image capture, that her analogies are strange and brilliant, but this strangeness and brilliance are formulaic and so unforgiving. This formula is not unfamiliar, and halfway through duty-free art, there becomes an expectation of stimulation, the gratification of uncovering late capitalism by covering a lot of ground. I think of Stella, my flute teacher from ages 12 to 14, young and married and sit sitting in delicate pumps and understated designer wear at her glass desk, filling the room up with a lesser known Chanel as I filled it with hot breath, extending long notes until capacity turns exhaust, ruthless claps to count the fluctuations of tone, furrowed eyebrows into her cell phone as I run through the piece again. Look at me, Stella, look how I play in terror of your gaze. This is obvious how submission festered until I quit flute to fuck myself up in high school cross country. It is under these conditions of Sterl's planetary civil war, the mise on a beam of games, imitation, identification, correlation as social abstraction, to count oneself out or above is apolitical, I repeat, on a beam, that I will begin to write a cover letter for a communications position. Earlier in the day before the depressive delivery of harsh text, I recount to M the startling form of Terrace House, how its public field does not intervene with the guest's private life. Although more accurately, it may be that private life is here so much on the surface of public engagement that change in attitude is foreclosed across several timelines. That of life lived in Terrace House, that of televised group t commentary, that of these narratives edited together for Netflix viewership, that of aired episode available to participants in real time of airing. The docufiction of this unscripted reality show relies on the imbrication of audience response with lived time, and its display in this edited form is so near to truth it exceeds documentary in inciting audience identification. Is it embarrassing that the game of identification and the more complex game of correlation are able to be enclosed by its near non monolithic means of dis distribution? Is it embarrassing to relate and relate to self-consumption in this way in lieu of living out a weekend IRL? Two Attic wives of 
Two attic wives of different formative experiences fight over who is closer to truth, who deserves martyrdom, and what that looks like within the attic, tearing bits of flesh and inserting rude things in rude places in the long durée of unfulfillment, to find in their individual insistence on separation, moving further and further towards edges of the bed, then corners of the room, then precarious beams between ceiling fans, that the attic has always been surveyed by viewers left, right, and center of the pop circuit. Neither can identify the model, make, and age of the first camera, though the high wearing of it, they agree, has always been attributed to the decrepitude of their attic room. Now identified, what sounds are true belong no longer to general spaciousness, but to particular bodies. In this gross revelation of audience, one packs their bag, dressed in the other's cloak, hoarding objects to sell or remember fiercely by. They ascend towards ceiling to survey the sleeping wife's lofted collection of saved snacks and fabric swatches, finding nothing. They left first, that bitch. Whose sleeping sound is this? The idea of fleeing is suddenly ugly, that of staying cowardly. If there were more certitude about what world is watching, they might consider inhabitation a while longer. Dear Mora, yesterday I learned about a task management app called Habitica that uses input to do items as reference for an RPG game. I'm not a gamer, are you? But the thing that is seductive to me is the promise of external reward, gold coins, extra armor, because what I'm finding lacking in my constructions of timeliness slash spaciousness is the aspect of secondary fulfillment furnished by external validation. For instance, that the ful fulfillment of an item of a list is not enough fulfillment for me. The process of updating my finance tracking sheet of following a self-devised schedule becomes rote process. And in this restlessness of getting nowhere, to get self-devised schedule becomes an in this restlessness of getting nowhere, to get nowhere with coins in my pocket changes the adventure. The rumor is that you can find your contacts in this world, perhaps form a guild, do battle with and against each other. Would you give this a go with me? Could we get somewhere digitally with virtual reward that feels too adulterated in and by the scheme of a real day? Will entry into this field of fantasy feudalism alter and alter well the daily prick of capitalism? Your shopping, my job seeking, our ties to the modalities of consumption slash production therein? Yesterday, I go to Penn Book Center, packed, standing room to the door, to hear Renee Gladman and Eileen Miles do their thing. Eileen reads from their new book, Evolution, and there is the first of many moments I am laughing among standing people, silent and laughing. They look down at their thighs, they write, I've had these since I was a kid, except that one time in the bathtub they were bunnies, but I was going crazy. This tendency toward revelation out loud, a quality of voicing, and the democracy of revelation sources, body, you, book, out the window, has stayed the same in me since I picked you up, Eileen, and thank you. I'm thinking about this body I had since I was a kid, what kind of measures of fashion and forwardness I've tried to extrude it through since. Some things become a figure of speech. I fell asleep right before I was late to this reading, thinking that if I were assigned otherwise at birth, I would still present femme to subtle fault line and touching tough, tender people. This revelation is tangential to my money troubles, as everything is. The way lack of funds goes straight for the neck of every day. Stay home to stay out of spending, hit satellite in hopes that spending $6 will pay for space of productivity. And it's always instead that I'm scaling away at my spreadsheet, avoiding the faces and tables of acquaintances so I don't need to explain myself gracefully, calling mom to provide unsolicited advice and refuse her pride, thinking, why am I trying for aspirational jobs when I need money right now, right now? Today, for instance, is a home day. I asked my sweetie how she measures productivity, a feeling to get to the momentum of getting it, and spent hours boiling, boiling a chicken for its broth. This will be recuperative, and I can quantify the time and cost of its recuperative powers. That's powerful. I read excerpts from Jackie Wang's carceral capitalism between moments of hard projection towards the seasonal USPS clerk job. This sure isn't the beach, but it could have been a beach day. My car needs an oil change, and I should talk to my therapist about a payment plan. Often you humor me by suggesting additional external structures for organizing this moment in time. I wonder if I am pulling my weight in this space, and more importantly, if you think I am. Possibly the question follows why I am not trying for internal change to meet what outside demands, and it's true my attitude could easily be more problematic than my joblessness or the fungible things between me and public benefits, goal-orientedness, memory, cultural acuity, conversational prowess. The emotional, the emotional retrenchment needed for times like this makes everything about me. I add more steps and more hours to this boiling, silky chicken than any recipe may require or even recommend, lifting the lid too many times, adding elements midway instead of all at once, because my interest is in counting things done. For dinner, before my housemates leave for their Canada camping trip, I will serve these cuts of extraneously placed care. Dear Mora, on Saturday, I find I'm scrolling through the Instagram feed while mukbang. It occurs to me that this is one of the places, if Instagram is a big place, that feels pan-Asian and almost exclusively Asian. 
There are several modes of eating show available on the surface, most not endemic to Instagram, but cropped and distributed through this conglomeration account. There are femme Korean self-filming at that angle that foreshortens the meal and audio recording with, audio recording with concerted release via slurping slash swallowing. There are men eating single item en masse and full frontal. There are northeastern Chinese office workers who ask colloquially for stars to vicariously eat hyperspiced chili noodles. There are children following the form for follows. I am lost and found here for an hour listening to texture sounds and getting to a point where I scroll through and where I getting to a point where I can scroll through and select the sounds I want to see by the foods I finger through. I don't feel guilty or turned on or full or any such extreme feeling after these hours. Do you have a place like this? Is it the direct consumption for show that relieves me of the shit of viewership? Is it the feeling that we both on differing screens and timelines are getting something out of this interaction? Is it that fullness becomes me as I receive this mirror, project back hunger, keep going? There's a headache living two inches behind my brow bones that smells like old coffee in a wool coat that I pulled from my basement this morning, staring down the situation in the fancy coffee shop that also smelled this, smells this way, which is confusing my sense of border. There's this person by the window I know. I know she runs this nonprofit artist network. I know from seeing her around that she looks perpetually tired. I'm coming, out, I'm coming from a mid-afternoon presentation artist residencies, feeling like the people who put together the money and space and time for other makers are also perpetually tired. To facilitate means to keep yourself hovering around the resource without touching, to wipe the glass clear for those who make and those who attend, to keep partition physical and invisible both. It's like the analogy of the window you pull from your repository time and time again. The last few days, I'm driving around, finding a good place to start thinking as Heidi makes calls about window shipments and types. There are windows you and I will never afford, and time again, this place, this piece is a movable piece. The analogy is returned to object, my productivity feeling the same way, which is to say, able to be polished and fit in the hole already cut out for it, nothing coming through the panes, but as I look, breath hovering in hope that something behind there makes a move, the air leaks, the October wind is the October wind, the crowd moves into question and answer, the text description stays the same. What is the same is that I am looking for the wrong things or the wrong things are being looked at by me. What is more is that determining attraction in real time with real partitions bears a different feeling behind my brown bone in my heart than knowing what I like to see online. I can collect tabs and feel good about having this archive in hand. This is my augmented wallet. When you say you crave the delivery of information, I feel that what I crave is the option of finding it out myself. This is dirtier than your desire. It is bait for technological development. I'm keeping it too simple. Yesterday at a lecture by Wendy Hui Kung Chung, the digital media scholar, I behold this beautiful prezi that discloses the clean clusters of found information and the swoopy transitions between them. Some content notes, too. The military connotations of store, hiding, keeping, keeping weaponry. That survey information rested by a privately owned public commons goes after habits and holdings, and these answers serve as proxies for race, because the algorithm assumes that like likes like, and that a discrete other that a discrete other group commonly dislikes the set of likes, clusters that divide, the algorithm assumes too, that one answers and engages authentically to oneself. And so authenticity is predicted by one's deviation from the norm, predictable expressions of anger, agitation, attraction. Twitter, for instance, so long as it depends on real representation of brand, successful body, because if silence is complicity, Twitter is authenticity. Instead of depending on clusters that divide, instead of segregation on the web, Chen says, instead of homophily, how about structures like electricity, units of opposites? I leave early from this talk to see Ray Armantrout in this new writer's house arts cafe, its walls still stripped and pencil diagrams laid bare. Add yourself to yourself, she reads from a manuscript. Now you have a friend. She collects found text from internet-based internet error messages and the Facebook posts of her poet friends, addresses these cheekily as if from whoever's living in my computer. And I am alive as ever, offline as ever, turned off by the feeling that body is always my frame of reference too. And I don't want to be overstock in this brave new world. I'm done facilitating for now. I want to be a prezi. I want to swoop from micro to macro and impress you with my informational assemblages. I try this out and only get as far as a prose block and I send it your way. Maybe tomorrow we'll go for broke. These days I've been put to work. Yesterday becomes unclear because the hours are numbers and the work is the same and my body in motion removes my will. I thought I'd have more paper cuts slinging parcels for the USPS by now. Instead, my whole hand feels like a callus and my fingerprints live not on my fingers but in the government documentation I've passed through en route to this job of jobs. Two shifts ago, I set up to repair mail. 
This means I bag damaged flats, Vermont country store catalogs, and political campaign mail two weeks overdue, fold and tape the tape so the address realigns into a plastic pouch boasting we care. I notice I've taped some of my hair in a few in my fervor. I leave these. The consequences of rote labor can look like care if the sample is small enough. There's a laugh that rises occasionally in my stomach that holds the epistolary form still at bay. If romance is alive here, my treatment of material is fleeting outer course. I return to repair mail between Amazon deliveries, which is the sole reason for postal work on Sundays. Priority mail in the meantime. Here's news from home. Your fragile packages are thrown all the same. I am stunned by the holds of subscription boxes still, of beard oil at all, of soft pack sports jerseys, of the oppressive mass of normcore return packages. Why don't you just wheel your stroller out of the mall? I think that makes sense. I don't say this out loud as we hurl parcels half-court into their massive corresponding hampers. I'd rather listen to Aaron Celine Dion and the voice of the scanner counting packages per route. Their 90 sounds dirty, and our unspoken chivalry and ducking and waiting is a fine dance that, as it is labor, will never be seen. There is no tenderness in the handling, and Celine pierces the veil. That's the way it is. Georgina's here. When she's not, Aaron jokes that as a youth, she played the Japanese character Tamlin Tamita in The Second Karate Kid. She's Filipino and tells me when we meet that her son lives in Philly too, went to school for English too. We laugh and her laugh is stern and glamorous. I tell her I may in fact be her son. I think you're my mom. And she laughs again. The next shift, she flits into the Amazon crisis when the second shipment arrives two hours late and the carrier's got to go and implements a system where all the bins are closer, swapped often. Not everything need, a, need be a shot. And I feel a second wind in being told what to do in this way. Later, driving a power jack because Ray and I are not yet authorized to, she drops off a skit of marriage mail. Says she'll pick us up later. Thanks, Mom. I have to wipe my nose real quick. Excuse me. In between... Is the mic okay? Okay. In between instructions at the repair mail desk, she asks if her son will find a job and if I am looking to do something similar with my degree. I do not say that I am a scab, leaving the daunting stage of my particular education to make money real, real fat, to make money real fast, or leaving the USPS come Christmas to return to this initiation quest of brokering my value in a field that speaks the language of alternative, social, and tokenable value. I have said this before, that I would rather be treated this way, wear gender like a projection, and be miscalled in passing on this factory floor that feels like the hell underside of a Costco, than misgendered stubbornly and paid more poorly to work at a nonprofit that makes false claims about the beauty of bodies making art under the umbrage of capital. This is a good mantra in that it instantiates dogged belief. Tomorrow I will try throwing with my left side and to remember bodily that city route 57 and 58 are staggered between two rows. Nothing is done when the unit of circulation is the time between the romantic ideal of an object and its being held. To say again, nothing is finishable when the parcels keep coming in bulk bags and shrink wrapped heaps, and if the process is immutable, so too are the things we carry. I rapidly lose interest in the material economy is another mantra, and I am, the, I am a dog for feeling useful and usable. Thank you. I realize I forgot to introduce Sammy. This is Sammy. He's not going to be reading. Our next reader is Bianca Stone, live from Vermont, perhaps featuring Odette, the toddler. Unclear. Um, but please welcome Bianca. And that's Odette. Hi, Odette. Oh. Uh, can you hear me? I can't. I'm like seeing something different than I'm hearing, but. Uh, I, I can see. We can hear you. Okay, you can. You're good. You sound great. Okay, thank you. I'm so glad you can hear me. And thank you for for letting me um, give a reading from the, the luxury of my own home. Um, I'm going to start with some new poems, then I'm going to read from my book, The Mobius Strip Club of Grief. Limousine. It's okay to say that humans are beautiful or not beautiful 
with acne down their necks, their hair falling out, the coarse film on their tongues, the forwardness of their genitals like an underwater plant. Hardship puckers the mouth. The food we eat makes us sour and forgetful of everything except why we hate ourselves. Well, it's okay that there are people who don't care about other people, that they clap and say, yeah, and nod and don't listen to anything but money and rituals of ferocity because every person was in love with the limousine they arrived in. Even if it drove away, even if it smoked too much and was always late to pick them up, they at first only wanted to be held by her and her nipple put into their mouth, even if it never was. It was the first thing everyone wanted. It was the first of their homes inside a woman, knowing nothing but her heartbeat her cough, her sighs, hidden behind tinted windows, the leather seat of her placenta, only the red silhouettes of the outside world deemed to disturb, ghosted what would unwind, mute and unqualified, what it was, is, the jug, the vessel, no matter what they are now, they drank deeply in her. wrote that sort of like in response to dealing with so many horrible people <laughs> running our country. Um, but thank you so much again. And Michelle, it's so good to see Sam, even, uh, even if it's not in person, really. Odette's like underneath my feet right now on my phone. Yeah. I'm going to read uh, some poems from the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. Odin plucked out his eye in exchange for a drink from Mimer's Well of Wisdom. He wanted to know everything there is to know of the past and future, and so it was. But the weight of wisdom made his face sour, seeing everything blown to shit, the gods with it. After that, he never ate again. It lived on a strict diet of alcoholic beverages at the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. Medieval. At the funeral, they carried boom boxes on their shoulders, blaring Chopin, swaggering over the snow and sink in all black, the cloth of penitents and matriarchs. A hole is free to dig if you know how to ask men with the right tools. Funerals need not break the bank. Through the yard, like a procession of Danes and duchesses from Hamlet, all hired mourners from birth, punters of rough gods, women of the saloons. Our funerals are like poker games in the back room at the Mobius strip club of grief. The stakes are high. You have to have pneumonia to get in. You have to cough and gurgle. You have to have a cat on your lap and refuse to eat. So a lot of these poems in this book are um, elegy poems about my uh, late grandmother, Ruth Stone. And, um, but they sort of exist in a like, um, a sort of purgatorial between place, uh, or afterlife um, uh, strip club of sorts. Uh, last words. After the funeral was out, the hors d'oeuvres came out. Olives, pate, sardines with soft bones and violent flushed organs. Too much wine slouched on a flowery chair. A pair of teeths on the porch with the early moon. I looked at the sky overhead where it said in the white jet stream cursive, dying is awful. And I lit my head on fire, danced a dance for the gods. Mom peeled out off down the mountain like Mad Max to sit alone in her house, to play solitaire in the dark. 
because they turned off the lights again. The pipes were frozen, the wood almost gone. So solitaire on the floor beside the wood stove, thinking about abandonment, about love, about luck, about money. Like a winter songbird it sang in her head all day, who will pay, who will pay, who will pay. I wanted to read this poem in, in honor of my like missed flight. Self-destruction sequence. You all still there? I can't see anything. Hopefully I'm not just like reading to myself in this room. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, you're there. Okay, it took a minute, but. Regarding falling asleep, waiting for my group to be called to enter the tunnel that would have taken me to 26D I nodded off and the plane left without me in my neck pillow, like someone in a hospital bed, completely unaware, waiting to be fixed, indifferent to everything. And perhaps what makes us miss things is that once in a while, we wanna stop getting what we're paying for. A small Dostoevskian mutiny, like buying a clear plastic box of salad that tastes old, and poisonous than throwing the whole thing in the trash. Our lives are a series of debts and payoffs that feel barely tolerable. In any way, whenever I walk across the sky to stand in line for the bathroom, I think finally I am just like a ghost walking over the world, trying to distract myself from boredom and hysteria. It's a kind of holy moment that unfills anger. Marcus Aurelius. Sometimes I wake up in the night with a terrible headache, my mouth blackened, a ghost looking for valuables in the debris. I turn on a battery powered light clipped to a book and write things down in the spirit of Marcus Aurelius, who said the finest bottle of wine is just grape juice passing through the liver. No matter the beauty of a frothing glass or a big night of truth seeking never recalled, the importance of putting something bittersweet into our mouths, turning it around and around on our tongues, attaching to it our missions our purpose. In the end, we are all just filters, not even as beautiful as the plainest bird or as zen as the meanest deer tick. Nothing is given over to, nothing new is lit. So often it is this, I wake up urgent, fatalistic, with the taste of nectar on my boughs. I replay on a loop my one stoic consistency my middle of the night vow that I will start tomorrow, the essential dismantling of what I live. <clears throat> um, this poem is called Nature. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to go on about it, but it's sort of like, well, it's, it's self-explanatory. I mean, we're just in a weird time in our world, in our culture, in our species. Um, and it's hard to sort of reconcile what we're doing and with the planet. Um, and, but there's also these weird parallels going on, I feel like, with uh, our role as a species um, and then uh, this sort of technology, our role as a species in nature and then the technology that's happening that we're coming up with as, as a species. Um, so this poem is, is about our sort of role in the whole uh, system. 
both in nature and uh, as sort of as sort of gods and servants at the same time. Maybe humans are the failed AI of nature. Maybe nature made something it thought would tend the garden. Maybe nature made something sexy to watch clean the pools with long butterfly nets and a sunburn, the retainers of nature. Now, mirror of mercury and hell, that hot red bomb in your mouth, that sweet battleground on your tongue, it is the catastrophe of your mission. The wealthy with their outstanding educations and custom shoes and empty apartments floating above like Glinda, the ballad of media, the intellectuals almost shepherding evolution, falling asleep in their haunted paintings and unattainable poetry, all the dimensions of each person's being punk, restless in a loop. Sometimes I want to be taken into nothingness. I want to be burned with the gypsy moths and bind weight, run to exhaustion with the wildebeest. I don't want this phone. I want to kill God. Maybe humans are the complex systems of a natural order that must build and destroy itself in perpetuity. Blue chicory on the road saying the end of summer in a sandstorm of our passing. They gyrate and smile. What of our little duties to the architect? Our deep red blood, our lesh tech, archangels limping in paradise. All right. Um, I'm gonna read just one more poem, but I'm, I'm it's really, crazy and cool to be here in this capacity and uh, I'm really excited to hear the rest of the reading. I'm going to watch it um, via satellite and um, <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for asking me. Uh, such an honor. So the last poem I'm going to read is called Artichokes. And this poem uh I feel like it's sort of about how men see women or how women see themselves through how men see women. Um, uh, and just sort of wrestling with that, that strange, that strange phenomenon our whole lives. It's called artichokes. I bet I'll never appear in a dream or a summer dress, or next door, displaying on one hand my prowess, the other my difficultness. I bet there will be just enough pain to keep me alive, long enough for the moon to be mine, just as the sea is of women, the cockle, the star, and the movements of the earth, just as the whale stuck in its baleen grin climbs up out of the depths and moves to its hidden spawning grounds. I don't know. What is it to be seen? I can forget its language I long for. Man and his ciphers cannot save me. Meaning cannot not pile me up with more meaning. I go off like a firework in the yard. I take the limbs off myself and club the air. For the dead women of television displayed artistically in the woods. For the details of their hair. For their pale skin for their now foul ravaged cunts. Do you have to be thus to be avenged? I don't know. I've seen the last of it, an ache to be saved. There are wildfires switching course to worry about. I take my daughter to the lake and watch her feel the tiny waves. A seagull lifts a sandwich right from my hands. I take out my tired breast. And of having felt like a small event for so long, having felt like an artichoke, scraped away at with the front teeth, one scale at a time, worked down to the meaty heart, but with the ultimate disappointment of meager flesh, of being thus, I bet I will live again. I bet I will appear in full gear, the armor of ugly, indefinite livability, 
the real body, alive or in decay. I'll appear like a thundering. I'll save myself and you and you. Thank you so much. Price is right. We're just like moving on up here. Um, so I'm going to say Lainey Brown, come on down. But um, I am. Our next and last reader is Lainey Brown. Thank you, Bianca. That was beautiful. We wish that you were in the room with us. Um, Lainey is amazing. If you are a student at Penn and have not taken a class with her, you should. I would if I could. Um, it's a rare opportunity to have a poet that is capable of so many critical and creative forms. I was telling my classes today that any class, any kind of poetry, medieval poetry, elliptical, conceptual, I would find a way to teach Lainey's work because her work does so much. We're so lucky to have her in Philadelphia and I'm so excited for you guys to hear her read and I apologize for any sounds that this one is making but you know it's all bodies and burps and what can you do? He wants to stay awake for the reading. So I hope everyone will um, stay after. We'll have a reception, books for sale, things to eat, talk to the poets, talk to each other. Thank you, Writer's House. Thank you, Emily and Zach, for the sound tech amazingness. Thank you, Connie and Bianca. Good night. Nobody drank it. Hi. I am so grateful to be here and to see everyone. And Michelle just did all these great thank yous that I wanted to say. Thank you, Kelly Writers House and Common Press and Michelle and everyone in the kitchen making the amazing poets in the kitchen, making a reception for us um, and Connie and Bianca. And I feel like it's so great to be in this new space, which is the same but different. Um, I feel like I've received so much nourishment in the space of listening and and everything that happens between all the bodies in the room, right? Before, during, and after, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and I wanted to just take a moment to just think about healing, to just dedicate this reading to healing. And while I speak for one minute about that, I thought, if anybody wants to move around, we're kind of all sitting down. Feel free to stretch, get up, whatever you need to do. Um, so I'm thinking about, um, specifically, I'm thinking about all the people displaced in California and people at Borders and people in Pittsburgh and uh, just injustice, just people who don't feel safe, which is a lot of people right now for a lot of good reason. So... Um, yeah, just I hope being in this space together can be nourishing for everybody as we go back out and in. It's, it's in the work, too. So, And then the other thing is that there were some cards floating around. So if anybody has a card that they didn't hand in, then maybe just they could start to make their way up. And if you didn't get one and you want one, um, thanks. Then Carlos and... Natalie, were helping me out with that. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to dip really briefly into three new books. And I, I feel like I have to give a little bit of a trigger warning because it's sad, sad, sad. So the trajectory of where we're going is um, this is a book-length elegy for my mother, uh, You Envelop Me, Poetry. This is the book of moments. It's short prose. And it's mostly dreams about dying. And this is a novel about tears and crying. So we're, we're kind of going from uh, lost to the middle piece is a little bit funny about being lost and then um, about human tears. So here we go. Can everybody hear me OK? All right. So I'm going to read the first poem in the book. It's called Owl Pages. It's in six parts. Owl Pages. Say goodnight to a page 
petting, mourning, fetching, listen, to plumage, move, with no sound, perch. The view from above is also the name of the dress. If only I could find, could find 90 feathers spare. We'll listen to your voice and know her color or form synonymous with her name is say goodnight action. What will be anyone's future? Protector from crush and velvet hued wing. Crave the color of not at all burnished, held, fancied, stewed, stained, blemished, burning, borrowed. Crave the color of cracked and borrowed ice. Garb that does not fit like a tourniquet, beaked like a troubadour, tawny incisors or vice grips within. Please protect her, protect her, accompany, our, occupy, escort us with sound, providing vintage hand-drawn guides to. If an owl flew over warriors before a battle, they took it as a sign of a sign of ascendancy. She kept a watchful eye on a sign of Athenian trade and commerce from the reverse side of her coin. If you walk around an owl in a tree, copper tree, it would turn and turn its head. How is it possible for her to twist to watch you until it rung past and past participle of ring? It rung a horizontal support for a foot whose own a sign of her copper book. We've been inside an owl's egg, begged to solve for perimeter, protection against drunkenness, owl stolen from rose. An eraser borrows your brain. I give you a powerful mantra, but how not to swallow the copper coin twist of she, Athenian at prow of copper tree, thinks in swatches of color and form synonymous, not needing the 90-odd feather twist of it all that used to be owl's eggs cooked until they turn to ashes, improve eyesight. If she recasts a passage, it is whatever she says it will be, long-eared and venerated, despised and admired. How long can this go on, her knowing everything? Outside, light, muddy, veil, slips, watchers of the owl flew with absolutely no sound, large, brown, landed in copper, eucalyptus, a bat and an owl in the same breath, same branch indicates ownership of owl, claims ownership for that thought location for night vision, chemise of prophecy, protector from forces that could pull a person into guardian waters, locations for if she recasts a passage of water, it is an owl on a rock above. An owl was once a girl, watcher of the dark, germination, tender of all underground peaches, russet bird in green bower, songs of dripping infrared, blind in daylight. She was both deceased and so the bird turned, a newly released night, a newly interim russet water beetle, newly released and ultimately pure air. This is an abrupt tone change. <laughs> uh, New York with no address. Last night I was in New York and supposed to stay with Jay, who had, as far as I know, never lived in New York. I didn't have an address though, just a vague memory of a brick building on the Lower East Side. I couldn't call because it was very late wherever she was not in New York. I was walking alone in the dark and then some young kids came up to me and told me that a policeman wanted to talk to me. The policeman started hassling me, made me very uncomfortable, so I somehow ditched him. Then I saw two young women walking in ahead of me. Can I walk with you? 
I asked. They were very friendly and also apparently didn't have the address for where they were going. I was beginning to see what a bad plan this had been. To stay with a friend in New York who had never lived there, wasn't there now, and couldn't be reached, having no address, arriving late at night alone. The women were companionable. Why didn't I think to call any of my other friends who do live in New York? They apparently didn't exist in this narrative. We walked and walked until I recognized a building front. Then I realized I didn't know the apartment number. The building was big with hundreds of apartments. I imagined myself mechanically turning a key in every door. Then, suddenly, we were inside. There were two long little dogs as if they had been stretched. The bathtub was filled with hanging laundry. There were no instructions as to how to feed the dogs. The two women came with me. I told them they could spend the night. Just then, a young man flustered and breathing hard, hair askew in an endearing way, entered. I recognized him as Jay's best friend, M. Oh, good M, I said. Can you please tell me the address here? As if this made perfect sense, M started telling me about the dogs. <laughs> okay. So um, this, uh, this needs a little bit of introduction. So Periodic Companions is a novel with characters based on the elements of the periodic table. So the characters are named by the initials and the relationships between the characters are based on chemistry. Also, they are really young, idealistic activists, and um, they don't have a lot of experience, but they have, <laughs> their hearts are in the right place, but they kind of don't know what they're doing. But they come up with this idea um, to do a public art protest based on chemical signaling in human tears because um, it human t emotional human tears lower testosterone. So that's kind of what they're trying to figure out. And I'll just say that, um, I'll just tell you some of the characters. So the, the narrator, Carbon, is C. And the narrator's um, best friend is Phosphorus, P. And you'll also hear um, Mercury, HG, maybe O, oxygen, H, hydrogen, A, S, arsenic, and so on. There's maybe 12 different characters. <coughs> P wondered about artists, academics, women, and instability, considering that several of her oldest female friends had struggled with debilitating depression she asked me what I think about the medicated life of H.G., for instance. I reply saying, I think it is his toxic institutional job that is destroying him. P. tells me that fragility is what I should call it. Call what, I ask, but she does not answer. Maybe she's writing a talk or a paper about fragility. Maybe it is an important word to theorists like disgust or failure. She might have been thinking out loud and not at all responding to what I asked her, which seems to be one symptom of this problem or the inability to taste one's tea. It was really excellent tea, P said, and she had to have it every day at three or four o'clock, but now she couldn't taste it anymore. This isn't fragility, it's desensitization. Is that why writing a note to an old friend one rarely sees because of geography when that friend has been diagnosed? It seems almost unfeeling to write something about her radiance. Does it come off as wooden because that isn't the way we speak? But P isn't listening. She's been desensitized and gets up abruptly and leaves without saying goodbye. She's that volatile. She swirls her white coat over her shoulders and is gone, liberated as vapor. See what I mean about the way we speak or do not speak? Well-chosen words act like a clasp, but the reason P gets up and bristles is that it is too close to her own scrape, a sidelong conversation we've never had, but clearly both intimate. Is it because she's here we don't have the conversation? Does muddled geography make some admissions simpler? 
Who is the one beside you, and who is the one you rarely manage to meet but understands you best? That is the kind of question H.G. would ask. Who is that you when you are at your computer screen? This is fragility, instability, how much easier it is when we are all at our computer screens, and how bleak. P's point, however, is not lost upon me, though she made it by saying nothing. She thinks that in order to create a fiction, I must remove myself farther from any memory of nonfiction. But then I remind her that she herself is not even a fabrication drawn from various real-life companions. She is completely fictional. Still, I have no control over her actions, and she does not listen because she does not believe me. P argues that appearance, properties, and structures can change at any moment. She strikingly often does not resemble herself. For many years, I did not remember her, and she could not recognize herself as she passed between various bodies, depending on her surroundings and partners. If she can resemble graphite, if she can be found in pesticides, toothpaste, and detergent, where is she located exactly? I first met P when we were still young enough not to know how little we knew. She was sitting in a corner of a very dark cafe at a waxy, colorless table. We had several friends in common, so I walked over and sat down. I thought she was highly reactive based on what I'd heard, but then I didn't know that she was never a free-floating element. She was reading. I looked down at the text discussing explosives, nerve agents, friction matches. She looked up and did not exactly express pleasure at seeing me, but she did eventually emit a faint glow. Even if she felt green, even if she'd been stoppered in a jar, which at times she seemed to have nearly been, she could still emit some visible light. I can't explain exactly what happened next, maybe because her reaction time is slow, by which I mean she didn't begin to emit the light right away, but the more time we spent together, the more I was sure that I never saw flame nor felt any heat, and yet I thought of her as a bearer of something essential in my makeup, not a cold chemical reaction, but more like I had evaporated or she had become a conductor of electricity, puckered sheets, linked several states of myself, as if she were already in my bones, quietly waiting to be discovered. Though P was rarely quiet, and I was later to learn all about her reactive qualities, once P told me the reason she never felt this way before, this way, meaning the desire for a particular state of being we had yet to create language to articulate, was that she did not have the right persons to feel this way with. You might wish to be enamored, she argues, but if you believe it possible for yourself or anyone, but that doesn't mean that you can just enlist whoever is beside you. This seems like an unlikely observation considering that P has fallen in love so many times, perhaps as often as I have written the alphabet. No, she demands dismissing my suggestion, but love was a type of shorthand for which we have never found a better or less objectionable word. We therefore agreed that we were talking about unification or the opposite of fragility and instability and also about the ability to emit light and all practices that could possibly point one in that direction. O said that he was interested mostly in ecstatic practices and that's why he chose drugs. P wondered why he didn't mean sex. H.G. says that he has no need for love, and H. says that everything she has ever done has been motivated by romantic desire. A.S. is shocked that anyone could entertain such ideas. P. says her notion has nothing to do with love, but it does have to do with desire, not for a person or anything physical, but desire to act within a landscape as catalyst for others taking action. P. says... It could be about anything relevant, hunger or shorebirds, or it could be electric cars or education. But she wants to affect change on a level that is difficult to describe, molecular or cellular, or to change our memory as a species. This is why H.G. is in love with something like systems theory. O, who is agnostic, claims there is no relationship between these concepts, and H. always disagrees.
I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> so I'm skipping to the part where they're, they're thinking about um, figuring out the public art action. Later that same day, happily caffeinated, we returned home. P said she didn't have time to read all of the books we had gathered. She dropped an armload of revolutionary titles onto the table. We read from Gene Sharp's From Dictatorship to Democracy and made lists from his first appendix of methods of nonviolent protests. The appendix contains 198 methods. We never imagined so many. We chose several to incorporate into our collective act we began with public speeches and statements. We made signs and banners with images of human tears. The next day, we began preliminary actions. We went to the public square, and one of us stood on the edge of the fountain and said something. Whether or not we were prepared to say anything, it seemed very bold or possibly stupid to stand on the edge of a fountain. H wasn't interested in holding a banner or signing petitions, but she did like to stand at the highest precipice on the fountain in the central ring, and she gazed out at everyone, and people gazed back. After practicing this on several occasions, H asked us all to abandon our signage and stand beside her and cry. L.I. joined her without hesitation, and N.A. followed. H.G. and O. laughed and said nothing. They devised faux petitions and mock elections for the role of cry leader. They convinced P. to be their candidate, and she wore a rhinestone tiara in her yellow dress. On our first attempt, the faux petition said, Sign here if you believe in chemical signaling and support collection of human tears for a public art protest. In a few days, we'd gathered hundreds of signatures. We developed a database so that we would be ready to collect the actual tears at a later date. We wondered how many persons would show up and considered incentives we could offer. We couldn't pay, and we knew we needed a kind of sloganeering someone in advertising or politics could muster. We knew we lacked the proper skill sets to devise these statements. Nevertheless, we began. We came up with tears against violence, and send a chemical signal for change. We read, cry the beloved country. We watched the film, cry baby. We study the crystalline structure of water and salt. We imagine a public bath made from human tears. We imagine the public fountain as a fountain of literal tears and wondered how passersby would react. Would they note any difference? We set up two small containers, one with ordinary salt water and one with tears in the public square while standing in close proximity to the containers held just under the chin we asked participants to gaze into the unmarked containers and did a double blind study composed of a series of questions which tested levels of violent impulse which we correlated with levels of testosterone we wrote up public scenarios to reduce tendencies to violence in dangerous situations. For instance, in our airport experiment, participants occupying a terminal could arrest the violent impulses of a suicide bomber by crying upon command. Surrounded by hundreds of crying individuals, in each instance, the suicide bomber would leave the premises, detach from explosives, and dismantle them. We imagine the implications of this action if globally persons were trained to cry upon command in combat, in demonstrations, in the wake of natural disasters, violence, looting, and damage could be avoided. We realized that we were ludicrously projecting, and yet crying seemed a skill all were capable of, and with a small amount of training, this skill had potentially staggering possibilities. This, of course, seemed ironic to us, the generally marginalized and cynical, but the notion fit in perfectly with the model of society in which we lived, in which free and harmless resources were often ignored, slandered, or denied. We placed a box in the public square labeled, Reasons to Cry. From these received utterances, we began to compile an archive of statements. P put on her yellow dress the color of flames, which statistically thus far made more people cry when she read from the list. Studies show that babies cry more in bright yellow rooms. She was merciless. People were activated and their metabolisms rose before she cried. To reproduce the entire list would be tedious, but here is a sampling. When I hear jazz, 
when we are at a restaurant and ask, what would Grandpa have ordered? When I conjure his presence to provide steadiness, wisdom, and discernment, when I sense his moral compass pointing towards justice and just how, sitting with us, watching the fire, I love you, Dad. I miss you, Dad. Wounded beasts. The death of the cat who chose you 17 years earlier. Existing. Because the future is scary. Spilled milk. Children. The environment. Spilling your pitcher of apple cider after spending hours making it and squeezing it through cheesecloth. <laughs> Hearing a song that made you cry when you were younger and cried more often. Strange dreams. The rise of fascism. Father-son movies. <laughs> Repeated sexual abuse. Borders. Your first love might support neoliberal politics. <laughs> Seeing videos of troops. Surprising families coming home. Letting emotions come out and express disappoint in oneself. Photos engulfed in fire. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lainey. Um, thank you, uh, the audience. The Writer's House is nothing without this amazing, vibrant audience. Um, I hope you guys will come to the reception, talk to the poets, purchase books, look at broadsides, talk to each other. And also, I forgot to thank Leah for your tech help. And thank you, Heidi. Thanks for coming to the Writer's House. <laughs>